As I sat on my couch, listening to Johnny Cash sing The Man Comes Around, drinking whiskey and ice and staring down an abysmal blank fucking page, I thought, God damn it, I do not want to write about Preacher. Not because I don't have anything to say, but because there is just too damn much to say. But here it goes anyway. AMC made a Preacher TV show. We're not here to talk about that. But rather, why would they take on such a foolhardy task? I mean... Preacher is beloved amongst comic fans, and it's not like Superman where it doesn't matter how bad someone fucks it up because there'll be another inevitable reboot or reimagining down the road. We probably only get one shot at Preacher, so if they mess it up, then that's what they're remembered for. So what else makes it a foolhardy task? The violence? Nah. Have you tuned into Walking Dead? Greg Nicotero is over there having a ball. Is it the sexual content? Mad Men had plenty, and Americans don't seem to be so puritanical about that anymore unless it's, you know, two dudes making out. Is it the language? While Preacher is rife with colorful language, the most beautiful and poignant dialogue rarely relies on profanity, and when the story calls for it, AMC doesn't seem to have a problem with just bleeping it out. You. So what is it? Besides disappointing fans, what makes producing Preacher such a risky proposition? Well, it's the same thing that made the comic a risky proposition back then. While the good guy of the series is a preacher, collar and all, the bad guy of the series is God Almighty himself. Ooh boy. So why do it? The only answer I can come up with is just too goddamn good not to. But before we get into that, in typical alpha rookie fashion, let's take a look at the year Preacher debuted. In 1995. There's no doubt the 90s are in resurgence. 90s nostalgia took a mediocre at best movie to the top of the box office. It had the power to bring back X-Files, and it's even bringing back Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks 2017. However, as history seems to be giving some 90s movies, TV, and fashion a pass, <laughs> comics history is another story. Most often described as the dark age of comics, the 90s are an equal parts fascinating and embarrassing era for the medium for obvious and not so obvious reasons. Can't, can't, can't. Even though the 90s got slapped with the Dark Age label, there definitely were some bright spots. While many books tried to grow up shooting for adult but coming up short into adolescence, there were others that were truly bringing comics into a place where they could be considered capital L literature. And that has a lot to do with the British Invasion. No, not that one, but that one's pretty good too. The British Invasion as it pertains to comics refers to British comic creators recruited by DC in the 80s, such as Alan Moore, Dave Gibbons, Brian Bolin, Neil Gaiman, Dave McKean, Peter Milliken, Jamie Delano, Grant Morrison, and others. The writers of the British Invasion are particularly significant, because while most everywhere else it was the artists that were becoming the superstars, to the point substance completely gave way to style, these British guys' names became synonymous with good storytelling and could move books on that alone. Some of their names still move books today for the same reason. By 1993, these guys had so indelibly defined what their brand of comic book style was that it needed a name. And so DC created the sub-imprint Vertigo, edited by Karen Berger, the person responsible for bringing over many of these artists to begin with. By 1995, the entire industry was in the twilight hours before the crash of 96, and a lot of the best-selling books looked like this. Look at that, it's so extreme with two Zs because it's so extreme the Zs are silent. Amongst all that bullshit comes Preacher number one. Preacher was one of the earliest original titles published under the Vertigo imprint. Some of the more famous titles that define the Vertigo era, like Sandman and Hellblazer, actually existed before the sub imprint was established and were carried over. And it's Hellblazer where writer Garth Ennis, together with artists Steve Dillon and Glenn Fabry, would develop the working relationship they would carry over to Preacher, reworking an idea they had for the Hellblazer title about the child of an angel and a demon. The rest is history. Preacher's 75-issue run, well, 66 issues, including miniseries and one-shots, but you get the idea, it sold consistently well, made the transition to the trade paperback market, and was actually instrumental in cultivating that market. It is considered by most fans to be one of the few, finite, long-form comic series to be a masterpiece. I'm just stating the facts. So what the hell is Preacher about? Preacher is about Jesse Custer, a disillusioned Texas preacher who becomes inhabited by Genesis, a powerful living idea created from the affair of an angel and a demon. Armed with the power to command others with his words, Jesse is compelled to find God himself, who has since abandoned heaven, and take him to task for his creation. He's joined by his ex-lover Tulip and his bromance partner Cassidy, who also happens to be an Irish vampire. 
Together, they travel America and a little bit of Europe to find God, all the while encountering all sorts of obstacles along the way, including the Saint of Killers, Hair Star, and the Grail, as well as Jesse's fucked up family. And I mean fucked up. But Preacher's wild premise is only part of what makes it so special. In the mid-90s, it stood in stark contrast to the mainstream books by having great characters, strong themes, a memorable story, and being actually, in fact, edgy in comparison. It also stood in stark contrast to its other moody Vertigo brethren by having a devilishly irreverent sense of humor. This is the book that has a character who eventually takes on the moniker Arseface, whose entire arc is sort of a satire on popular music and celebrity, and this is also the book in which a villain's character arc includes slowly and physically turning into a penis. So Preacher was edgy, irreverent, and took the piss whenever and wherever it could, but this is still not what has made it an enduring classic in my estimation. In fact, it's the crazy over-the-topness of Preacher that I think overshadows what a brilliant piece of storytelling it is a lot of the time. What I mean is it's guys like Moore, Gaiman, and Morrison that kind of keep popping up in the conversation of good writing in comic books, and they absolutely should. But I feel like Ennis gets left out more often than not because of the dick jokes. Frankly, it's a bullshit attitude, and it's the kind of thing that has Hollywood handing over Oscars to the quote-unquote serious movies year after year when there's infinitely more powerful, complex, and deserving recipients. One of these things is not like the other. So yes, Preacher is hilarious, and if you don't have a stick up your ass, you'll have no problem admitting that. It's scathingly satirical in the best ways, and as long as you don't have delicate sensibilities, you won't have a problem admitting that either. Who told you I had delicate sensibilities? Preacher is also an atheist text, straight up. So, at this point, you could be forgiven for thinking that Preacher sounds like a supremely cynical book. I hate myself and want to die. But that would be so, so far away from the truth. The truth is, while Preacher doesn't have much positive to say about faith in God, it has profoundly, sincerely positive things to say about people. Alice Cott, writer of Zero, great book, has called Ennis one of the key humanist writers of comics. That really hits the nail on the head. Here's a good example. The subject of the Vietnam War comes up several times when dealing with Jesse's father, John. As a Marine returning from the war, John asks a young woman where to catch a bus, only to have that woman spit in his face and call him a baby killer. When dealing with the subject matter of Vietnam War veterans, the conflict itself, and its place in history, it would be so easy to only humanize the soldier who went through hell for his country and villainize the woman. It would also be easy to do the opposite and humanize the woman, justifying her rage at a conflict that took innocent lives. Instead, Ennis has them get coffee together, fall in the most intense kind of love, and end up making a baby together. That baby being Jesse Custer. Preacher's about the dogmatic pitfalls of faith, but it's also as a result about the freedom and honor in taking responsibility for your own actions. It's about how fucked up America can be, but it's also about how we should never abandon the American dream. It's about what it means to be a man, but it's also about what it means to be a man that has any hope of living side by side with woman. I don't know how you could get prettier. Uh, no! <laughs> and that sometimes being a man means getting over what it means to be a man. It's about calling bullshit and making people own it, but it's also about forgiveness. I could go on for an hour about any of the things Preacher is about, but to send this thing off, let's take a look at what it says about the cowboy and the American identity. Preacher is a Western, no doubt about it. Jesse wants to be a cowboy, and his hero is John Wayne. In fact, John Wayne acts as sort of his conscience throughout the series. Hell, the whole thing begins and ends in Texas. Preacher gets real into the idolatry of the mythical cowboy, but it never for one second forgets the reality of America's frontier history. If you need any proof of that, just take a look at the Saint of Killers. If the specter of John Wayne is the idealized American hero, the Saint of Killers is definitely its shadow's dark reality. However, Preacher, as a comic, implores us not to allow the cynicism of reality to get in the way of romantic ideals. In one of the later issues, Ennis writes about the Alamo. Look too close and the legend cracks, but then, that's legends for you. Was Bowie a slaver, a drunk, a psychotic? Did Crockett beg for his life before Santa Anna, for mercy that should never come? Are heroes nothing more than desperate men? No. To dwell on such things is to miss the point. Most times the world can be a pretty complicated place, but navigating it can be as simple as doing the right thing. There's right and there's wrong. You gotta do one or the other. You do the one and you're living. You do the other and you may be walking around, but you're dead as a beaver hat. For Jesse Custer, that sentiment is couched in his father's last words to him. 
For me, it's one of the most memorable and powerful lines in the book, and as far as I'm concerned, it's on par with Spider-Man's great power, great responsibility mission statement. In fact, very ironically, given Preacher's subject matter, I quoted him in a letter written to my younger brother for his confirmation, and it goes like this. You gotta be a good guy, Jesse. You gotta be like John Wayne. You don't take no shit off fools, and you judge people for what's in them, not how they look. And you do the right thing. You gotta be one of the good guys, son, because there's way too many of the bad. All right. So maybe I got a little bit lost with my initial point here, and I'll try to wrangle it back right now. What am I saying with all this? The title of this video is, Why Did AMC Make a Preacher TV Show? What makes it so special? The answer is that Preacher is irreverent, hilarious, transgressive, sincere, insincere, action-packed, and overall entertaining in a way I don't think people have ever seen on TV before. But it's the profound things it has to say about people that will make a classic if adapted correctly.